All right, good day, morning, afternoon, and evening. Bonjour tout le monde. Today's book is uh, this Isaac Newton, man. Uh, Principia. Let's see, how you say it? Well, it's the Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy by Sir Isaac Newton. Translated by, uh, translated by Andrew Mote. Um, also added. Okay, added. Cool. Uh-huh. Newton's System of the World. That's at the very end. Uh, first American edition. That's very important because, uh, all right, so when was this made, right? This was in um, late 1600s. You got like 16, 16, uh, let's see, 1687. Um, and then it was like revised in 1713 and 1726. And I was like, okay, so this is probably one of the first math books, like ever, right? I'm, I'm excited. Uh, so it's translated from like Latin, okay? And this dude, Moat, um, I don't know much about him. I don't know much about any of that stuff, but I know how I was presented physics and, and math, right? So my whole reason for reading the book was because I'm like, well, I know what I've accepted, but uh, where does it come from? And so this is one of the first ones. Didn't do much research as far as into what was the most uh, relevant thing to read and all that, but I know this is something that the man wrote, right? But I'm going to tell you now, I had a lot of uh, reluctant, feelings and hesitancies going along the way and then realized man my mind was blown by the end okay by the end but the first is 200 pages or something this thing is like 594 right uh the first couple of hundred i was just mm. okay so let's just dive in it's a lot of good things especially at the end of the book um so i i just recommend the book i would love to have a conversation on it if someone else has read it okay all right, let me uh, bring this down a little bit. Okay, uh, so it starts off, this isn't him. Nah, this is a dedication, right? Okay, I'm just gonna, let's just go. Teacher is the highest and most responsible officer man can feel. Yeah, sounds great. Mm -hmm. uh, let me make sure I line up for my comments. I got comments on here. That's why I love that. Um, it is an office that should be esteemed of even sacred import in this country. So I'm like, all right, so this is coming over from from England or Britain, wherever, and it's coming over to America. This is like dedicated to the uh, New York, what is it? Uh, State of New York, right? So it's going to like New York College or something. Uh, let's see, the first American edition of the Principia, Principia of Newton, the greatest work of the greatest teacher, is most respectfully dedicated. I'm like, okay. So immediately I was like, oh, sh okay. So we're in the late 1600s, there is no physics as, as I know it now, even in existence over here. That's number one. And I'm putting things in context with, of course, uh, slavery going on and the middle passage and all of this. And I'm thinking about that aspect of it. And I, and I gotta tell you that racism is a sickness. It's an illness. Racism and even religion in a lot of ways is a mental condition that a lot of people can suffer from. And it just, puts this lens over everything. Am I talking about Newton specifically? No, I'm talking about myself. And I'm also talking about, <laughs> okay, let's get this introduction. Um, let's see. So glad I highlighted it so I can go fast. All right, so it starts with the life of Sir Isaac Newton. And I was like, okay, well, this isn't written by him. Um, so what do we learn about Sir Isaac Newton? Who was calling me? Oh, no, not now, not now, cuz. When, when I'm done, I know. All right. Um, so Isaac Newton, born on the 25th day of December, 1642, Christmas day. Okay. So I was like, he just happens to be born on Jesus' birthday. Hmm. Now I'm, you know, or, or Jesus' accepted birthday. Now I'm just bringing in this. I'm like, they didn't have birth certificates. Okay. Anyway, Woolsthorpe, Paris. So who's going to prove that? All right, fine. Uh, but I was like, you know, good enough. Paper kites he introduced, carefully determining their best form and proportions really and the position and number of points whereby to attach the string he also invented paper lanterns these served ordinarily to guide the way to school and when in the morning so i'm thinking man worship they're just okay it's all about his inventions right i'm like why we have this whole thing about making this person the first okay so that's that's what i'm thinking his thoughts rose to the sun and by careful and oft repeated observations of the solar movements he subsequently formed many dials one of these named Isaac's Dials was the accurate result of years labor. Okay, so we just wanna talk about all his accomplishments. Fine, I get it. Okay, he was now 15 years of age. When I say what schools were there in 1656 in Woolstrop? Um, 
because I'm wondering um, what was he learning in school? This this amazing person. So now I'm just kind of like I, I don't want to even accept what I'm about to read. <laughs> but I'm telling you, everything changes. But anyway. He was now 15 years of age and had the great progress in his studies, but she, desirous of his help and from motives of economy, recalled him from school. Business occupations, however, and the management of the farm proved utterly distasteful to him. So now I'm thinking about um, privilege and how you have a choice in your labor and how, uh, oh, it was distasteful. Oh, <laughs> and there is no other mention of any other family, of his mother, of any other influence in his life. He stands alone. And I hate that. Uh, that was something I see in a lot of like uh, when I read about oil, the history of oil. When you read about people like uh, these biographies where they make these men, especially when it comes to European men, you know, I'm just saying um, the uh, in, in science and in industry is all about this man's genius. And you can think about just I mean, the list goes on of these leaders and the Rockefellers and the you know it's just this man he's just oh this man I'm just like where are all the influences so that's putting a bad taste in my mouth now this is just the introduction this is not Isaac Newton's words this is whoever this other guy is and that's key there that's key okay his attention was soon drawn to the judicial astrology he exposed the folly of the pseudoscience by erecting a figure with the aid of one or two of the problems of Euclid he had a little aid of Euclid Regarding the propositions contained in Euclid itself as an evident truths, he passed rapidly over this ancient system. And when he mentions ancients, uh, for most of the book, he's talking about like Greeks. But then surprisingly, it goes to Egypt. I was like, whoa, a step which he which he uh, after afterward much regretted and mastered without further preparatory study. Oh, because we got to make sure we say that he didn't have to. He didn't have to study much. The analytical geometry of Descartes, Wallace's arithmetic of infinity uh, of, of infinities. Oh, I don't. Okay, cool. Um, Sanderson's logic and the optics of Kepler. He also stated with great care. Okay, I didn't even recall them mentioning that because it made it so much about him that later on, when he starts giving credit to so many people, um, I was looking down more and more at his introduction like this isn't the man i'm reading his words does not paint him in the way that this uh intro does and i'm like that's and he reminds me a lot of nikola tesla in that respect that um you have people that can uh say certain things about you and they have a certain view of you but you yourself wouldn't even esteem yourself that way or talk in that way okay it gets better um to the velocities with which every line or quantity is generated, he gave the name of fluxions and the lines or quantities themselves that of fluence. Okay, so that was cool because, um, yeah, he does use these terms. Okay, at this period, uh, let's see, Newton, having applied himself to the grinding of optic glasses of other figures than spherical. Okay, so now I'm like, oh, so he was also just, uh, um, mechanically inclined he could he could construct like he was good with his hands too so not only is he a philosopher but he just has this woodworking capability right and i was thinking in my head um well woodworking cutting glass whatever it is i was thinking they are making this man into a jesus figure now that's what i'm thinking that's what i'm thinking at this stage of his optical researches he was forced to leave cambridge on account of the plague which was then desolating england he retired to woolsthorpe so so i was thinking about what must have been going on when there's a lot of uh, upheaval in the community and the society that you're in but that doesn't affect you as a student and all this stuff like you're still able to study like you are an exception to the rule and again it's all about him and not about so much of his influences and who's helping him how's he eating every day what his daily life is like it's just, it just seems like a middle class upper class old manor house okay anyway he passed his days in serene contemplation now I'm thinking about any child uh, who is raised around nothing. You aren't just going to absorb the world and become a, a genius with not uh, without anything around you. So, so I'm just wondering what is his. You know, I, I, I didn't. Mm, that didn't rub me right. Uh, my wisdom on playing with sticks in the dirt. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Towards the close of a pleasant day in the early autumn of 1666, he was seated alone beneath a tree in his garden, absorbed in meditation. <laughs> 
because that's how little kids are. Hmm. <laughs> Sixteen sixty-six. Oh, but I think he's in his maybe. Uh, let's see. When was he born again? Let me make sure. I ain't trying to trip. Okay, it says um, born in sixteen forty-three. So he is twenty-three at this point. Man, you are a lonely twenty-three-year-old, right? Okay. He was a slight young man in the 24th year of his age. Okay, there you go. His countenance, mild and full of thought. For a century previous, the science of astronomy of astronomy had advanced with rapid strides. Now, the science had advanced. Now, was he reading all this science or is he just sitting around, don't got no friends, having him in school? Okay, so I'm just, I'm just saying. It's probably clear, but this is what my mind is. The human mind had risen from the gloom and bondage of the Middle Ages in unparalleled vigor to unfold the system, to investigate the phenomena, and to establish the laws of the heavenly bodies. Oh, because they weren't doing that for hundreds and thousands of years before him, right? But um, again, this is the words of this guy, not him. Okay. His mind familiar with the knowledge of past effort and his unequaled faculties developed in transcendent strength was now moving on to the very threshold of its grandest achievement oh oh what a man what a man what a mighty <laughs> to ascertain this master fact he compared the space through which heavenly bodies fall okay whatever in 1667 newton was made a junior fellow and in the year following he took his degree of master of arts and was appointed to a senior fellowship having thought of a delicate method of polishing okay having thought of a delicate method of polishing metal he proceeded to the construction of his newly projected reflecting telescope, a small specimen of which he actually made with his own hands. Now, by the end of the book, I realized there were plenty of conservatories and all this other stuff going on. Like he didn't just invent a telescope. People weren't able to see out to the stars and all this. That's that's not what that's not what appeared to be going on. And to just put all this stuff on him, and they even had a picture of like uh, his reconstructed telescope. And I'm just like. What is this dude constructing this stuff? Like, it's, it's just not lining up in that way. <laughs> but I'm still thinking like Jesus the carpenter, right? Okay. To these, I may add some general heads for inquiries or observations such as at present I can think on. As one, to observe the policies, wealth, and state affairs of nations so far as a solitary traveler had mm, convenient, may conveniently do. Um, what was this? Uh, he provoked me so much that I cannot bear it. Uh, Okay, nope, just gonna keep going. Um, as for particulars, these that follow are all that I can now think of. Hmm. Oh, this was funny. Whether at. Okay, who was this saying this? Uh, because this is important. Okay. Uh, but in the same case, you may bear the marks. You will find a little advantage. Oh, I think this was. Uh... Okay, in the spring of 1699, he wrote to his friend Francis Aston. Okay. Um. And as interesting as exhibiting some of the prominent features in Newton's character. Okay. First, I shall lay down some general rules, most of which I believe you have considered already. <laughs> and okay, if not all, yet is my punishment more in writing than yours in reading. So this made me think of like 12 commandments, man. I'm telling you. I was like, why would this be in here? Like, what is what is going on in this life of Sir Isaac Newton's section right now? So yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, okay. Uh, as to observe the policies, wealth, and state affairs of nations so far as solitary traveler may conveniently do. And so how are you doing this? How are you going to observe? Like, so now I'm thinking about England and what's going on in Africa and what's going on in the soon to be Americas and the islands. And I'm like, here's this guy who is of advantage in this situation not a part of it right um okay and then this as for particulars these that follow are all that i can now think of visa so he's talking about just listen whether at wherever in hungary where there are mines of gold copper iron vitriol antimony etc they change iron into copper by dissolving it in a vitriolate water which they find in cavities of rocks in the mines and then melting the slimy solution in a strong force which in the cooling proves copper the like is said to be done in other places which i cannot now rem remember uh africa that's why i highlighted that perhaps too it may be done in italy so it's all europe and stuff's going on up here but we don't know about all this extraction and maybe he didn't know maybe he didn't know okay 
At the mountains of Bohemia near Cilicia, there will be rivers whose waters are impregnated with gold. And now I'm thinking, okay, now you're talking about gold in Bohemia near Cilicia? This is not, that is not in Africa. <laughs> but you're talking about that there, but not what we're getting from Africa. Okay. Perhaps the gold being dissolved uh, by some corrosive water like aquas regus and the solution carried along with the stream that runs through the mines there is newly contrived in holland a mill to grind glasses plain with all and i think polishing them too okay so again you already have um this grinding of glass and the polishing all that's going on he didn't invent that process they were doing it right so that's where i'm getting at okay, um Bar with some years since was imprisoned by the Pope to have extorted from him secrets, as I am told, of great worth, both as to medicine and profit. So, Holland, you learned about medicine. So I was also thinking about um, all of the texts, like from Alexandria and from what I mean, just all the things that they were getting from like Northern and Eastern Africa. And how a lot of those texts we, we still haven't seen. So many things have been lost. So many things are hidden. So many things are secret. And I was even contemplating at this point, what do they have in like the royal society? He became that. What texts do they have there that they were reading there that we still haven't seen? And again, this is coming from Latin. So this is a translation of things. This is already secondhand, but third hand, fourth hand when you consider it coming from the Greeks and from Africa and so on. So. All that's going through my head. 1672, our author stated many valuable suggestions relative to the construction of reflecting microscopes, which he considered even more capable of improvement than telescopes. Newton, it is thought, made his discoveries concerning the inflection and diffraction of light before 1674. The phenomena of inflection of light had been first discovered more than 10 years before by Grimaldi. Let us see. Okay. Pyramids was our note. And Newton began by repeating one of the experiment of the learned... Jesuit admitting a beam of the sun's light through a small pinhole into a dark chamber and I immediately thought of the pyramids like we had already seen this in the pyramids they had okay so I was wondering then are there texts that are showing this in the pyramids showing how these lights you know from the sun rising or from the sun setting coming from the from the east or coming in from the west and how there was a uh, beams and how they were going through the pyramids was that available to them was that something that they were saying that we have never had access to newton advancing upon this experiment took exact measures of the diameter <laughs> i was like exact measures of the diameter of the shadow of a human hair okay so my comment was uh we don't do science in a vacuum who are his peers what facilities where was he doing these experiments right um and if he's an experiment full time and i'm thinking of nikola tesla you know and all the stuff that he went through like there's a team of people, but we're stuck on putting all this credit on Newton. And I was just like, that that bothered me. Okay. At different distances behind it and discovered that these diameters and breaths were not proportional to the distances at which they were measured. Okay. Uh, so really, I'm not enjoying the book at this point. Um, he, however, was the first to determine the law of the production of these colors. And during the same year, made known the results of his researchers here into the royal society okay so this is when they continue to go back to the royal society and i'm just like hmm if i want to continue to investigate this stuff that's where I, I would look is into their history uh newton was the first to suggest the idea of the polarization of light here we are again giving him the first like how can i trust you you already told me he was born on okay it's not so crazy that he was born on december 25th which you know we can't really prove but what was interesting, I'm just going to get to, uh, he died on uh, supposedly March 20th, which is like vernal equinox, which is like Easter-ish. So it's like he was born when Jesus was supposed to be born and he died when Jesus was supposed to be died. Are we really trying to elevate this man? Is that what's going on? Um, the members of animal bodies move at the command of the will, namely by the vibrations of this spirit. Oh, that, that comes in at the end. Um, so that was great that uh that uh yeah the that's gonna be good the spirit was no anima mundi nothing further from the thought of newton but it was not on his part a uh partial recognition of or attempt to reach an ultimate material force a primary element by means of which in the roaring room of time this material universe god's visible garment may be woven for us he does talk about god i'm not big okay 
There's good reason to suppose that our author was a diligent student of the writings of Jacob Bemin. Okay, so starts mentioning names. Starts mentioning people's names. Locke, who was an intimate friend of the author, wrote to him for his opinion on a certain fact stated by Boyle's book of colors. I was like, okay, here's another book to reference. Um, I looked a very little while upon the sun. Oh, now listen to this. <laughs> this is Newton talking about what he was doing. This is this genius now. Okay, this is dated 1691. Oh my God, 1691. Now, what was he born? Let me check that date again. 1643. Uh, so this is an old man almost. I mean, he and his uh, he good and wrong. I looked a very little while upon the sun and the looking glass with my right eye. Now we ch children know not to stare at the sun. This is Newton talking about he was staring at the sun. Um, this I repeated a second and a third time. Okay. Now he's done it for so long, right? If I shut my right eye and I looked with my left, the spectrum of the sun did not appear till I intended my fancy upon it. But by repeating, this appeared every time more easily. He's talking about the effects of staring at the sun, okay? But to recover the use of my eyes, shut myself up in my chamber, made dark for three days together and used all means to divert my imagination from the sun. This dude said he locked himself up. Now this is like, oh, this is Nikola Tesla. This, this man was half crazy. He was, uh, he was maybe autistic or um, just, just one of these really eclectic minds where, you know, very much like a genius. Now I'm not taking away no credit from him, but socially I can't see him making it. <laughs> I just don't see him being socially accepted. I can see him being awkward, recluding himself. This man is talking about how he shut himself up in the dark so he could stop thinking about the sun okay but that for some months after the spectrum of the sun began to return as often as i began to meditate upon the phenomena even though i lay in bed at midnight with my curtains drawn but now i have been very well for many years i was like what what we find him in a letter to dr hook secretary of the royal society dated november 1679 proposing to verify the motion of the earth by direct experiment namely by the observation of the path pursued by a body falling from a considerable height. He had concluded that the path would be spiral. So this kind of goes to uh, the uh, things perpendicular to the vertical of her of the horizon. They're going to fall straight, but when, when things are in motion, they're going to have this curvature and all that. Um, so he's talking about spiral, like, you know, yeah. So this is when you're starting to get a little math here. Now, I hadn't even started talking about the math. This this was just throwing me for a loop just over the uh, the life part. So let's let's get to it. Our author aided by this correction of his error and by the discovery that a projectile would move in an elliptical orbit. Now, okay. When under the influence of a force varying inversely as a square of the distance was led to discover the theorem by which the afterwards examine the ellipsis. Okay, they're putting it on him again. The measurement of a degree of the meridian executed by this other dude, a French astronomer, 1679. Newton took the memorandum uh, of the result afterward at the earliest opportunity, computed it, computed from it the diameter of the Earth. Furnished with these new data, he resumed his calculation in 1666. So it's saying that he took this stuff and he came up with the diameter of the Earth. Okay. Composed a series of about 12 propositions on the motion. <laughs> oh, this, this was the 12 part. Uh, a series of about 12 propositions on the motion of the planet, uh, of the primary planets about the sun. So that's when I was thinking of 12 commandments. Um, these were sent to London and communicated to the Royal Society at the end of 1683. At or near this period, other philosophers for uh, Sir Christopher Wren names a lot of pe uh, people. They were engaged in investigating the same subject. So, boom, right there. Oh, but with no de definite or satisfactory results. So they're mentioning other people, his contemporaries, but they're still putting it all on him. The work was entitled Philosophy Naturalis Principia Mathematica, dedicated to the Royal Society and presented there too on the 28th of April, 1685-86. Um, but after second thought, I retained the former title. It will help the sales of the book, which I ought not to diminish now is yours and though newton gave a minute and positive refutations of such claims yet to reconcile all differences he generously added to this uh, da -da -da, uh that ran hook and haley are acknowledged to have independently 
deduce the law of gravity from the second law of Kepler. Did you hear that? Now, Newton said it. He said it. Newton said that these other people deduced the law of gravity from Kepler. Independently. He acknowledged that. Now, again, we give all this credit to him, but he, in his own words, wouldn't even give that credit to himself. Very important. There were no resentments, however, as we conceive in his design to suppress. He sought peace, for he loved and valued it above all applause. But in spite of his efforts for tranquility's sake, his course of discovery was all along molested by ignorance and presumptuous rivalry. Really. The Principia, a work to which preeminence above all the uh, productions of the human intellect has been awarded, a work that must be esteemed, a priceless worth as long as science has a votary or a single worshiper be left to kneel at the author of truth. I have indeed composed the third book in a popular method. Yeah, so that's going to be good. I'll, I'll get to that. Um, he does. Uh, the third book was one of the best. Okay, the principle of the universal gravitation, namely that every particle blah, 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 is a discovery which categorizes the principia. Okay, wait. Every particle of matter is attracted by or gravitates to every other particle of matter with a force. Yeah. I don't agree. I don't agree that that is the principle. Um discovery of this whole thing anyway uh let's see he demonstrated too that this force okay now this is him trying to summarize this stuff summarize his book but that's what i'm going to do so from the depths of his own soul through reason and the word he had risen a priori to god from the heights of omnipotence through the design and law of the builded universe he proved a posteriori a deity <laughs> oh man lest the system of the fixed stars should by their gravity fall on each other mutually he hath placed those systems at immense distances one from another um let's see okay let me get out of this now uh energy almost superhuman i mean listen to how they talk about this dude newton began his theological research at some time previous 1691 in the prime of his years and in the matured vigor of his intellectual powers uh, an energy almost superhuman to the discovery of physical truth the bible was to him an unest of an inestimable worth and the elastic freedom with a pure and unswerving faith in him of nazareth gives his mighty faculties enjoyed the only completest scope for development what um okay Newton's religious writings are distinguished. Uh, so recently, um, he had a uh, writings that he said, here it is, here it is. Okay, in the winter of 1691-62, on returning from the chapel one morning, Newton found that a favorite little dog called Diamond had overturned a lighted taper on his desk and that several papers containing the results of certain optical experiments were nearly consumed. His only explanation, exclamation on perceiving his loss was, Oh, Diamond, Diamond, little knowest thou the mischief thou hast done? Okay. And there was recently um, some of these burned papers that were supposed to have been a part of this incident um, where he was trying to discover uh, the cubit from the pyramids. Um, so he's actually exploring things in Egypt and he has these writings. So that was like being bid over. You can Google it, man. Newton in Egypt, like, or Newton in the pyramids. I don't know. It's freaking crazy. But you don't hear that part of the story, do you? Okay. But of all the books he ever wrote, and there's more, by the way. Um, there was one because of the light established upon thousand experiments. Uh, this book. Okay. Let's just get to, uh, in 1692, he prepared for and transmitted to Dr. Wallace the first proposition of the treatise of quadratures. So quadratures, they're like, uh, the, so you can think like a precursor to calculus, which is another thing that he's supposed to have invented, which he doesn't. Mm -mm. He, so quadratures has more to do with, uh, the area, but not so much integration. Here's another thing about this book so i'm thinking you know newton's three laws you know and inertia f equals ma uh equal opposite reaction and i'm thinking uh equations not uh one now granted no not in the form that we see them today with variables no not at all 
that stuff comes later. So I'm thinking of this being like a precursor to other math books that we have in America and the way that we learn the subject. Um, and I realized that it's all secondhand, thirdhand, fourthhand, fifthhand. Like who's actually studying what he wrote and then saying, I understand this. Now let me teach it to you. How is that being transmitted and filtered down through academia? Because how many of my math teachers know any of that stuff? How many of their math teachers knew this stuff? Or is it just like, accept this, accept this? So that regurgitation and that acceptance of information when not being able to prove it, not understanding how they proved it, how they deduced, how they, um, the, uh, the deductions they make, the inferences they make, the proofs that they make, uh, not knowing those, but still accepting things. That's really what I was getting here. Um, in 1703, he was chosen president of the Royal Society of London. So 1703, slavery is still in full swing, and we got people um, in a royal society who are so isolated from that that um, you can call them racist. They're just benefiting from the spoils thereof. Um, okay, the publication of these mathematical treaties was made necessary in consequence of plagiarisms from the manuscripts uh, of them loaned by the author to his friend. I'm telling you. I was upset at myself for even picking this book at this point. I mean, I had got a couple of things, but I was like, God, this is Lord. Um, the first edition had been sold off sometimes. Copies of the work had been had become very rare and uh, could only be obtained at several times their original cost. But um, by the by book three, I was so glad I stuck through it. It's just good stuff. Um, it is a notable fact in Newton's history that he never voluntarily published any one of his purely mathematical writings. The cause of this unwillingness in some and in other instances of his indifference or at least want of solitude to put forth his works may be confidently sought for in his repugnance to everything like contest or dispute. So they're just really elevating this dude. And I was really thinking that maybe they were trying to put England above like Germany or, I mean, the political nature of this introduction to his writings was just clear to me. Like if, if you think that this stuff is without politics, without um, prestige, without trying to put someone above somebody else, nah, don't even try it. Don't even try it. Um, the preference is clear. Um, persistent in maintaining it to his own invention by reason that he had found it by himself without knowing that Newton had done before and had much improved it. So again, um, yeah, so Leibniz invention of the differential method. I thought you are thinking about, so you're talking about calculus now. Now this has nothing to do with calculus, this book for real. It does mention infinitesimals and, you know, ad infinitum. Um, over and over again, which is interesting because, okay, the book was translated from Latin, right? But why are they still putting little Latin phrases in instead of go ahead and, and translating those? Like, why would you do that? I'm just going to leave this one little Latin phrase when I'm translating everything from Latin? I, I don't understand. It's like, uh, you know, deja vu. Eh? It's like I've seen it before. I don't speak in English. It sounds better to do it. But don't. No. I don't know how they do a Latin accent. And therefore, we take the proper question to be not who invented this or that method, but who was the first inventor? Because that's what's important. Who did it first? No. Um, and that was something with that racism and that bias, my own internal bias. I saw it myself in that statement because um, in trying to put things back to, uh, to Egypt and to Africa and all that stuff, yes, it's important to place it in time. But if you are a scientist, then you're only trying to get to the root of the, you're trying to get to certain answers. You're trying to get to certain solutions. Um, so, <laughs> um, the verdict is universal and irreversible that the English preceded the German philosopher. There it is, by at least 10 years in the invention of fluxions. Newton could not have borrowed from Leibniz, but Leibniz might have borrowed from Newton. So again, this is me seeing myself. I want to put certain, um, I want to over and over again establish the, uh, everything starting in Africa and with the pyramids and all that stuff. I want to put it in. But I think the reasoning, my reasoning is different from theirs because they're like countries trying to, you know, have power and, you know, England 
in Germany, right? This is this is going straight into World War II, like you know the space race. So this this is a hundred years over centuries years old. This kind of robbery, but the blocking of history that's a whole different thing i mean when you are literally trying to erase certain parts of history to degrade another people to make them feel less than themselves subconsciously not necessarily on, on the surface that's a different thing or maybe it is closer than i realize um but to uh once you know the facts you don't need to argue no more i mean get to a goal right okay so that was my biases there was in him, if uh, we may be allowed the expression, a wholeness of nature, which did not admit of uh, such imperfections and weakness. The circle was too perfect, the law too constant, and the disturbing force is too slight to suffer scarcely. Any of those eccentricities would so interrupt and mar the movements of many bright spirits. Um, in brief, the words greatness and goodness could not, humanly speaking, be more fitly employed than when applied as the preeminent characteristics of this pure, meek, and venerable sage. Oh my God. Ugh, ugh. All right, let's get to, um, Newton was induced to prepare his larger work for the press and had nearly completed it at the time of his death. It was published in 1728 uh, under the title, The Chronology of the Ancient Kingdoms Amended, to which is prefixed the short chronicle from the first memory of things in Europe to the conquest of Persia by Alexander the Great. Alexander the Idiot. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, in 1731, his relatives, the inheritors of his personal estate. Okay. Mentions his relatives, finally. Like, I'm like, I know nothing about this dude's family because family's not important. We want to put praise on this man and make sure that he's known in history to be the first of this inventor of this and even the idea of inventing as opposed to discovering um, is, uh, I don't know. That was putting a bad taste in my mouth. So he died. Um, oh, it skipped it or I skipped it. Well, it said he died on the vernal equinox. Like he, I mean, it didn't say vernal equinox. It said like March 20th or something. And uh, I, I just thought that was crazy. Okay. How long was that intro? Jesus. Uh, we are at 37 minutes. Whew. Okay. Now, his words. Um, and we hadn't even got to math yet, right? Okay. Because I'm, I'm all about the math stuff. This is what I really want. The moderns, laying aside substantial forms and occult qualities, have endeavored to subject the phenomena of nature to the laws of mathematics. I have in this treaty, treatise cultivated mathematics so far as it regards philosophy. It mentions the ancients. Uh, geometry does not teach us. He that works with less accuracy is an imperfect mechanic. And if any could work with perfect accuracy, he would be the most perfect mechanic of all for the description. Okay. Of right lines, so when he says right lines, he's talking about straight lines. And I was thinking right angles, so I was, I was like, right lines? It took me a while. Upon uh, which chemistry is founded. Uh, let's see. Our design, so I was confused because he's saying our and we, and I'm thinking like, I thought this was just you talking to a lot of people, like who is our and we? Uh, so anyway, we offer this work as a mathematical principles of philosophy. We give an example of this in the ex, um, explication of the system of the world by the propositions mathematically demonstrated. We derive from the celestial phenomena, the forces of gravity. By other propositions, we deduce the motions of the planets, the comets, the moon, and the sea. I wish we could derive the rest of the phenomena of nature by the same kind of reasoning, uh, which forces being unknown philosophers have hitherto attempted to search nature in vain. Now, of course, when I start off a book, I'm always like highlighting a little more. Um, okay, and this is Trinity College. Cambridge 16 for date. Man, that's a lot of stuff. Okay, so that was his intro. Let's see. I'll read the last part. The argument to prove that the moon is retained in its orbit by the force of gravity. Kirk's observations of the comet. Okay, so he spends a lot of time on the moon and a lot of time on comets, uh, especially toward the end of the book. Um, book one. Here we go. All right. Here we go. I have found by experiments on pendulums very accurately, accurately made. Now, he didn't say he made the pendulums. But he said he found by experiments of pendulums. Okay, I was like, okay, so we're gonna get into some experiments maybe, okay? Here he mentions inertia, or force of inactivity. Uh, 
but motion of rest is commonly conceived are only relatively distinguished, nor are those bodies always truly at rest, which commonly are taken to be so. Uh, okay. Okay, so the way he breaks it down, he has a whole lot of definitions at first, like a whole lot of definitions. So I'm like, okay, I don't really know what we're going into. <clears throat> okay, scolium. So that's like a, uh, this is the, the more general conclusion of what I'm trying to lay down for you. Um, and you have like postulates, and you got theorems, and you got lemmas. Um, so those headings occur over and over again. But the scoliums, those ended up being the best things for me to take from. Um, I do not confine time, space, place, and motion as being well known to all. It will be convenient to distinguish them into absolute and relative, true and apparent. Okay, so he's defining time, space, and all this stuff. I'm like, all right, um, okay. And again, this is a natural philosophy to uh, mathematical principles. So he's like putting those two together because when I learned math, you know, it was more about like, okay, it's all objective. It doesn't uh, have to do with nature so much. Physics, yes. Mathematics, no, right? So it's like two different, uh, the science and math don't really come together. They, they kind of started out separately and then they slowly come together. Physics being the best um, demonstration of that in my history. Okay, wherefore, if the earth is really at rest, the body, which relatively rests in the ship, will really and absolutely move with the same velocity which a ship has on earth. Um, then the sailor will be moved truly in immovable, immovable space toward the east with a velocity of 10,001 parts and relatively on the earth toward the west with a relative uh, velocity of 9. I don't know why I highlighted that. Um, the necessity of which equation for determining the times of a phenomenon is invinced as well from the experiments of the pendulum clock as by ellipses of the satellites of Jupiter. Okay, so here is when I first started seeing him mentioning things that... I didn't know he knew back then, like orbits, right? I, I didn't know he had that stuff at his fingertips. I didn't know that was a part of his contemporaries and those before him that he knew these orbits, okay? For it may be that there is no body really at rest to which, it may be that there is no body really at rest to which the places and motions of other, okay, so here we go. He's uh, He shows that he is laying out reasons to believe a certain thing without proving these things now when i say prove i'm talking about experiment like uh it, it'll make more sense okay from thence we might compute the quantity of their circular motion so but how we are to collect the true motions from their causes effects and apparent differences and vice versa vice versa how from the okay uh for to this end it was that i composed it Okay, axiom, laws of motion. Here we are. Here's your uh, state of rest. You know, his famous laws. All right, you got inertia, um, force, double force will generate motion all together at once, gradually and successfully. Um, now, he doesn't do F equals MA, right? So this is the second law, F equals MA. But he's not talking about mass, and he's not talking about acceleration. He says the alteration of motion is ever proportional to the motor force. So the alteration of motion, that would be like the uh, direct proportionality uh, with A, force is to acceleration or force is to mass as mass increases, force increases, but not the inverse relationship of mass and acceleration to a force. That's something, I mean, he doesn't have no F equals MA. That's not what's written. Um, to every action, there's always opposed equal opposite reaction. Yep, 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 okay. Now I'm going to go pretty fast through this because he has a lot of figures and everything about this book, one, is him proving things like he'll make a, uh, okay, let's see, for on what has been said depends the whole doctrine of mechanics variously demonstrated by different authors. For from hence are easily deduced the forces of machines which are compounded on wheels, pulleys, levers, cords, and weights ascending directly or, in, or obliquely and other mechanical power. So he's bringing in information from a lot of other sources. That 
if nothing else, I think that's a part of his genius is how many sources he has studied. And I was really questioning if it was just him. Were they trying to build a mythology around this guy and they all collaborated on this? Or was it truly just him writing? If it is just him, you know, again, Nikola Tesla, I put it on that level of just research or any kind of scholar that does a lot of research in one field and compiles all that information. I can see that because he's compiling more than he's inventing anything. He's just bringing in a whole lot of sources saying, okay, we got this over here, this over here, this, let's uh, maybe it can go together like this. And somebody else said the same thing, but let me put it all in here together. I mean, over and over again. But these are cases which I do not consider in what follows, and it would be too tedious to demonstrate every particular that relates to the subject. Over and over again, he's saying stuff like that. Like, uh, and I could prove this, but um, ah, let's just move on to the next thing, right? The common center of gravity of all the bodies. Now, this was something I loved, was the way he talks about center, center of gravity. Center of gravity, which, Really, I take to the center of your mass, center of mass. Like if you think about like how you have a pole or a pencil or something and you can balance it because you put it on the center so it'll balance and that sort of thing. That idea, I just love that. Um, okay, anyway. Always be considered from the motion of the center of gravity. Okay. Hitherto, I have laid down such principles that have been received by mathematicians and are confirmed by abundance of experiments, not his experiments, other people's. Um, so he's talking about Galileo discovered. So again, now I'm trying to, now I'm slowly coming out of that crazy ass introduction of his life because they're putting all this stuff on him and now I'm reading his words and he's not talking in that way. He doesn't talk like that. He's talking about all these people. So here again, by the same, together with the third law, Sir Christian Wren, Dr. Wallace, and Mr. Hugens. And this dude, Hugens, he did a lot of stuff. Um, he's coming up later, but this dude is awesome. The greatest geometers, geometers of our times did severally determine the rules of the Congress and reflection of hard bodies and much about the same time communicated their discoveries to the Royal Society, exactly agreeing among themselves as to those rules. He's talking about his collaborators. He's talking about his collaborators. Now, he puts a lot of figures, and it's always like when you're studying geometry, because a lot of this book is geometry based. Like, he's not proving things with experiments through most of the book. He's talking about inserting geometry to the motion of bodies. Like, he's like, let's take all this stuff that we know about geometry and let's insert velocity, let's insert centripetal forces, let's insert centrifugal and those accelerations into the bodies. Let's insert that onto geometry. Not like, so my thought was that they just discovered these elliptical orbits. They just discovered these, uh, how the moon was in a nearly circular orbit or da, da, da. They discovered that uh, as if the geometry was there. No, they already had this huge understanding and breadth of knowledge of geometry, of conic sections, because that's Egyptian, I mean, cutting up the cone, um, inserting that geometry onto the motion of bodies. So that's what he does through like most of the book. He's inserting motion of bodies onto geometry, and he's putting all of the inverse relationship and centripetal force. He's deducing that, not proving it like through measurements. He spends more time like on the okay. We'll get to the data part, but you're not going to see data like, therefore, this is true because this, this, this. No, it's like geometrical proofs. Okay. Um, this I tried in balls of wool made of tightly and strongly compressed. I determined the quantity of their elastic force. How are you determining, determining elastic force? Like, that didn't make sense to me. Um the measurement of force like you think about measurement devices so what are you and this is like my understanding I'd say it didn't happen but I'm just like how are you measuring force like, mm, I just don't understand the devices for that so he doesn't go into that but again a whole lot of geometry sets up a figure he's gonna place these geometrical proofs into motion of bodies um, and indeed if those weights were not equal the whole earth floating in the non-resisting ether would give way to the greater weight and retiring from it would be carried off in infinitum. 
That might have been the first time I saw it. So that's why I highlighted it. Okay, so book one, Motion of Bodies. Here we go. Lemus. So he gives you a figure. And he gives you these points. And he's like, let's talk about these points. Uh, and are all diminished in infinitum. So he's just setting up this infinity kind of scale of decreasing values. Hence, the ultimate sum of these evanescent parallelograms will, in all parts, coincide with the curvilinear figure. So, all right, so he's giving you figures, and he relates them to bodies now. All right, so another figure, another, I say, okay, now it's him. So it's not the we and all that stuff. Now he's on I. I'm, I'm saying this. And therefore, in all our reasoning, I was like, oh, my God, what, what is it, man? Who are you? It, is this how the mathematicians and the scientists are going to flip-flop between, you know, them and who they're representing? Like, I don't understand who's talking right now. That was why I did that. Um, let's see. More curves. Uh, anyone is said to be as any other directly or inversely. Uh, let's see. As if A is said to be as B directly and C directly and D inversely, the meaning is that A is augmented or diminished in the same ratio with B times C times a over d so right here i was trying to keep up with this now for the first 200 pages i'm reading every one of these lemmas and every one of these proofs and the thing about geometry when you learn geometry is or i guess within the kind of math the use of explaining the figure that's absolutely still still going on today and so you see the figure but when you're in class you have to redraw it you have to understand the relationship of a to b for instance uh here, right? Sort of letting you know, like, if it was a, uh, I'm not going to go through one completely, but you want to know that, for instance, AD is uh, half the length of AC, uh, or it is uh, twice the length of AC, or you want to know that um, A little c, or these figures are, um, these lines are parallel, these lines are parallel. Um, this is half the distance here. Uh, this angle goes here. This is a similar triangle here. Therefore, and you have to keep going back to the figure to see those similarities so you can understand the deductions and the inferences that are coming from those assumptions of this being equal to this and this being parallel to this or this being perpendicular to this. And so whenever he's going through this, you have to keep going back to the figure to follow the train of thought. That's what geometry is all about. Like, oh, now you can see how this is equal to this because you can see how this is half of this or this, you know, subtends this angle or this intersection goes here. Da, da, da. So through each one of these lemmas, man, this is like a day of work or like an hour, you know, five minutes to read it. But then you got another 10 minutes to draw it. You got another 10 minutes to take each part of this case down. And then you have equations that you're actually going to justify on the figure so i was trying to follow okay and then you got this qed thing right all right qed i was like what is this um so qed is this latin which was to be demonstrated okay so he puts that at the end of a lot of the things so again this is almost like geometry um early geometry the way that they would prove these things so kind of like proof complete so you see it there and then you see it there uh whoops uh so yeah uh anyway uh so that just keeps going so 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 i'm reading these things and then i'm still going i'm like god this is hard okay it's all geometry all geometry more figures more geometry now why is he doing this geometry that's what i'm thinking in my head like what does this have to do with every what does that have to do with anything everybody that moves in any curved line now, this isn't nature. This is all geometrical, and he's putting motion on this geometry. So I was like, all right, all right, okay. It's just figures. This isn't nature. So I'm like, this is so separate from nature right now. This is not what I thought I was going to be experiencing. Um, more figures, more proofs. Um, he's just proven, proven, proven. And just listen to the, okay. And by a like reason, a body will be moved in an ellipse or even in a hyperbola or parabola by a centripetal force, which is reciprocally as the cube of the ordinate directed to an infinite remote center of force. Now, this is a great example. I didn't even need to highlight it because he's inserting a body will be moved in an ellipse. Now, he's not proving that, but he's inserting that. 
and he's saying that they're going to move in all these different um, shapes by a centripetal force. That's the thing, by a force. So then with that assumption, then he's going to put that force, he's going to put those equations in. Now, what I find interesting is that it's been put in so well that it seems to work. Even with the, um, the and he does give credit to how uh, things aren't exact, you know, but it's a good estimate, right? Um, but I wasn't satisfied with it being proved. I just saw how he was inserting uh, centripetal force onto geometry. How he was doing that inverse, um, the inverse law, the, the inverse square. He was able to put that into all of all of the geometrical um, shapes, parabolas, hyperbolas, ellipses, ellipses. Yeah. Okay. So more, more, more. See, I didn't have the highlight because uh, it's all geometry, man. And I was just like, God, dude. I, uh, uh. And then just the way it's written is just fucking terrible. I mean, who wants to walk through this kind of proof? Let us next suppose that the opposite side AC, where's AC, AC, and BD, B, oh, this isn't a good copy, BD of the trapezium. So so just like with, um, um, I'm glad to bring this up, with, uh, what's his name? Theophil Obinga and his um, book on the, the African uh, geometry. Um, some of the words translate to trapezium, which we call a trapezoid now. So he's talking about this trapezoid, A, C, D, B. Um, and uh, the difference that I noticed was how Theophil Abinga and a lot of the African um, hieroglyphs and all of those texts, Ryan Papyrus, Moscow Papyrus, uh, list goes on. It relates to things that they're experiencing in nature. Uh, I mean, a lot of it. Uh, so it's not written in this way, but I'm like, were there more texts that the Greeks were taken from um, that we haven't seen uh, that were stolen earlier? Um, so anyway, those kind of thoughts. But yeah, this geometry is just boring. It's hard to relate to anything and uh, more and more proofs. Okay, so the geometry section, hella boring, hella boring. Almost done with book one though. Wow, I didn't have any highlights over here. Jeez, I know there's more. Uh, little break, uh, break. Oh, so many, so many propositions going. Likewise constructed in the following manner. Yeah, and it's it'll, it'll be impossible too to even try to, uh, I mean, just the copying is kind of rough. But I did see that this is also on Wikipedia. Like you can read the whole thing because after a person has been dead for a hundred years, apparently you're good to use their stuff. Um, the copyright kind of died off or whatever. Okay, so I really did like that he started including more circles, geometry of circles. Now he didn't get into like spherical geometry, which I love. That's some fun stuff. But uh, he uh, does use circles and curves. And again, he inserts the gravity on there. Now, I really thought I had more highlights over here. So I'm a little worried if they were saved. <laughs> All right, we're almost done with book one. Let's see. I think it ends on. Let's see. Uh, oh no. Book one ends on 256. So Jesus, we're on 178. Let's go to book two. Uh, I really don't understand how. Oh no. I think I lost my highlights. No way. No way. No way. Oh my Jesus. I'm about to be real sad right now. Mm -mm. It is, oh. Oh my goodness. Three of one third. There we go. I've been, okay. Well, that was good for me to skip because um, I, I just skipped a whole lot because I was in the search bar. Okay. Hence also follow what Sir Christopher Wren and Mr. Hugens, uh, let's see, have discovered concerning the vulgar, vulgar cycloid. Yeah, so the cycloid, Mr. Hugens, he, uh, now again, Newton gives a lot of credit to a lot of people in this thing, contrary to what society 
says about him um, being the first and all that stuff. He's talking about all his collaborators the entire way. I mean, again, Mr. Hugens demonstrated. Um, the Cycloid. Just look it up. It's pretty cool. Um, for gravity, as will be shown in the third book, decreases in its progress from the uh, superficies of the Earth upwards in a duplicate ratio of the distances from the center of the Earth downwards in a similar ratio of the same. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Let's see here. All right. I have hitherto been, let's see, what does it say? No such thing in nature. It was my comment. I have hitherto been treating of the attractions of bodies toward an immovable center, though very probably there is no such thing existent in nature. Now, of this is of the motions of bodies tending to each other with centripetal forces. Uh, oh, I might have skipped a lot of the talk about gravity where he mentions it being a theory that he talks about the nature of the theory uh, but here's a good example of how he's talking about the centripetal forces and how he can't show this in nature and I'm just thinking my goodness okay c considering the centripetal forces as attractions though perhaps in a physical strictness they may more truly be called impulses but these propositions are to be considered as truly mathematical and therefore laying aside all physical considerations, I make use of a familiar way of speaking to make myself the more easily understood by a mathematical reader. And I'm thinking, who does that? Um, speaks about, I just feel like if a person truly understands something, uh, I mean, he's a, he's a special guy. So, yeah, my comment was that's a huge disclaimer. Like, I'm, I'm saying all this stuff, but uh, I'm going to lay aside all physical considerations. This is all theoretical, is what he's saying. Um, okay, so right line is straight line. So again, what I find interesting is that it, it's been accepted because of, like, the breath and the way that, basically, the way that he's proven the theory through all of these proofs, and we've inserted onto... Um, motions and, and all that I just feel like uh, it's just ready to be replaced by some other mode basically I mean and maybe there are more uh, techs out there doing just that okay so again here he is doing all of these uh, French sorry Latin phrases that they just don't translate so Cateris Perilous all of the things being equal <laughs> yeah that was just me being upset um, about these phrases and from the same reasoning it appears uh, at the quadratures okay let's see uh, ex equio that means equally equal uh, let's see Sisges. so joining of opposites close union uh, this is used by Carl Jung uh, so he's talking about like the moon with the earth or like two bodies and how they are um and sing with one another somewhat in uh, relation or, you know, some orbit around the other, whatever, inconsequential. And I'm just like, all right, all these Latin phrases, he goes just translated, blah, blah, blah. Um, I hear you use the word attraction in general for any endeavor of what kind soever made by bodies to approach each other, whether that endeavor arise from the action of the bodies themselves as tending mutually to or agitating each other by spirits emitted or whether it arises from the action of the ether or of the air, or of any medium whatsoever, whether corporal or incorporal. Anyhow, impelling bodies placed therein towards each other. Um, in mathematics, let's see what my comment is here. And with that, I'm reading headings, headings and scoliums from here out. Okay, so this, yeah. In mathematics, we are to investigate the quantities of forces with their proportions consequent upon any condition supposed. Then, when we enter upon physics, we compare those proportions with the phenomena of nature, that we may know what conditions of those forces answer to the several kinds of attractive bodies. And this preparation being made, we argue more safely concerning the physical species, causes, and proportions of the forces. And I was like, all right. He's explaining what he's doing after the fact. And I was like, from, from that point on, I'm going to get through this book by reading uh, headings and stuff because I'm tired of his geometry. Okay. The same thing supposes above I say that the corpuscle placed without the spherical 
So purposes is attracted towards the center of the sphere with a force reciprocally proportional to the square of its distance from that center. Over and over again, he's talking about that reciprocal square, uh, uh, that inverse square law. He, he uses it over and over again. Um, let's see. So then it decreases. Still geometry, right? Still geometry, still geometry. Geometry, geometry, geometry. You're just inserting it on there. Okay, and I really think that this was a model of how math books were going to be created because rather than know why and how we got to a certain conclusion, rather than being able to prove that the earth is round, we just have to accept that. Like smart people found it out. Don't worry if you can't prove it. No, look, can't you see? It's evident, right? It's truth is evident. No, it was it was proven. It, it was a lot of rigor that went into it. I still can't do that, um, but I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Therefore, with a given force, the body will move in a parabola as Galileo has demonstrated. So there he's talking about bodies moving in a parabola and giving credit to Galileo. Uh, if two similar mediums be separated from each other by a space terminated on both sides by parallel lines. Um, so here he's like, am I in book two? I think I'm in book two now or almost. Um, he's bringing in like fluids. Uh, he's talking about like things going through different mediums, right? Like uh, objects in motion going through different media. So you think about light and refraction and he goes into that. So that's another thing about this book. He doesn't just stick on the motion of bodies. He starts hitting all these things, all these other, okay. The same things being supposed in that the motion before incidents is swifter than afterwards. So yeah, uh, the body will be at last reflected and the angle of reflection will be equal to the angle of incidence. So the thing about light, right? He's just throwing all in this, the, the kitchen sink, uh, all that stuff. Um, the water in the sink. All right, these attractions bear a great resemblance to the reflections and refractions of light made in a given ratio of the secants as was discovered by someone else. And consequently, in a given ratio of the signs, as was exhibited by Descartes, for it is now certain from the phenomena, um, phenomena of Jupiter's satellites. I was like, they knew about his satellites back then? Um, confirmed by the observations of different astronomers that light is propagated in succession. It requires about seven or eight minutes to travel from the sun to the earth. Didn't know they knew that in the 1700s. Crazy. But... Um, it shows again that he is only compiling that information and we think of Newton as like all things coming to him, but he is regurgitating a lot of what other people have already said. I mean, the majority of this book is him regurgitating things and just combining them in a certain way, but it's not like coming out of his head out of nowhere. Right. I mean, that was the, again, the biggest revelation. The rays of light that are in our air as lately uh, was discovered by Romaldus by the emission of light into a dark room through a small hole. I put pyramids again. Okay, here we go. Therefore, because of the analogy, there is because of the analogy there is between the propagation of the rays of light and the motion of bodies, I thought it not amiss to add the following propositions for optical uses, not at all considering the nature of rays of light or inquiring whether they are bodies or not, but only determining the trajectories of bodies which are extremely like the trajectories of rays. So now he's going into light. Okay. Now, so that was like his intro into book two. Oh, and he does have a book of optics that I do want to, uh, that I was thinking about reading at some point later in life, because, uh, but I already downloaded it and it's a lot easier to read than this one. So if you want to read some Newton, I, I wouldn't read that one. Um, so he's talking about the motions of bodies again, supposing the force of gravity in any similar medium to be uniform and to tend perpendicularly to the plane of the horizon. So you make inferences about this force of gravity. So you're going to put this force of gravity on, um, certain uh environment situations uh, yeah what i did like was let's see uh he started talking about basically you know you have the experiment of things falling at the same speed and so you think about the feather and it's like well why not this feather or you know the miracle of flight and all that and i like how he talked about it. he put everything in, in boxes um he had like gold and he had these different metals and one thing and he had like um, wool or some other stuff in another box, same dimensions of the box. So to basically, uh, the same weight of material, 
but in a different, um, but in boxes that were proportional, right? And allowing them to fall and that proving that the acceleration was the same. So I think that the um, proof of the acceleration toward the earth, that makes enough sense in my head. I feel like, yeah, I get that. But when I think about proving orbits and all that, the data, I have to find that stuff because I just can't do it. I mean, to know what, how much they studied the stars back then, that's really where my education falls off. Because I can accept it all day long and just be like, duh. But to prove it, to, to, I mean, to be able to look up at the stars and talk intelligently about what's going on, please. Gravity and a falling body, uh, let's see. Reminiscent of kinematic equations uh, was my comment. Gravity and the falling body, which in its fall describes the space in I produces a velocity with which it will be able to describe twice that space in the same time as Galileo has demonstrated. So what I realized here was we put equations on the ellipse to say that, you know, you sweep out a certain area in a certain amount of time. Uh, that's going to be consistent. But the velocity of the object going around that ellipse, that's what's going to change. So if you're further out, you're going to go uh, a lot. Uh, let's see. Anyway, that proportion was something we put on. So you can program that proportion and see what it looks like for it to be true. But that doesn't mean that the model of that truth is exactly what's happening in nature. So you can think about any kind of computer program of the solar system. It doesn't have to directly show you what is actually taking place in the solar system, but it looks cool. It's like, oh, that's what's going on. There it is. I see it. Look, that's how it goes. But it's programmed that way. So you can program models to behave a certain way, but that doesn't mean that it actually reflects nature. So that's where I am with, I get how we can program that to be a certain case, but how is that proven? How did you take the speed and sweep out the area with these orbits and see the distance they're related to this elliptical shape? Or is it way off from the elliptical shape? And I don't know that, you know. So th those are the questions that were kind of coming up. Once I got past the fact that Newton himself wasn't about trying to be the first and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Therefore, where the medium is of no density, the, the projectile will move in a parabola, as Galileo hath hitherto for demonstrated. Uh, okay. I was like, man, I need to read some Galileo for real and some Kepler and some Leibniz. I need to check these guys out. Um, but you know, like listening to Neil Grass, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson and how he like puts Einstein way up here. And I was like, well, let me, let me read about him. And I have opened a way to this in prop, uh, da -da -da, in which the uniform resistance arising from the tenacity of the medium may be substituted for the force of gravity or be compounded with it as before. But I hasten to other things. <laughs> uh, a spiral. So he's talking about these spirals. And I was like, that makes more sense to me. And I was really thinking about the moon. And just like, gravity doesn't seem to explain in this centripetal acceleration. I hear what you're saying. That basically you're going to accept the hypothesis of this centripetal force and, and uh and then gravity and the speed of the moon keeps it in this like, because my idea was that the moon was more in a more circular orbit, which from all the models that you see, it pretty much looks like a circle more than it looks like an ellipse. If anything, I'm like, a spiral makes more sense. That thing should be spiraling down if it's based on this gravity thing. Like there, there's gotta be something else. So to fully understand that, it's gonna take a little more. Again, it's easy to accept things as truth. You think about religion, but when you question, then you can put yourselves up there with those who uh, came up with these ideas. Um, okay. To find the density of the medium in each of the bodies thereof, by which a body may describe a given spiral of the density and compression of fluids, hydrostatics. Uh, yeah, so here... He names a fluid, and my comment was uh, the attempt to master nature is clear. He starts naming stuff again. You know, here we go trying to name stuff. So he's making his definitions again. He spends a lot of times on fluids. I didn't really care much about that, um, as you can tell. Let's see, uh, fun pendulous objects. Uh, okay. Oh man, 
This is when I, let's see. Newton's influence on John Locke was mediated by Huygens, who assured Locke that Newton's mathematics was sound, leading to Locke's acceptance of a corpuscular mechanical physics. Um, yeah, so his contemporary, man. Um, and in this statement, I looked up the fun pendulous bodies. Um, oh, and then I looked up the cycloid isochronal, and that's when I read more about the Christian Huygens and how that credit has been not from Newton. Now, Newton talks about him throughout the book, but we don't know about him. We, as we learn about science, because we keep putting everything on this one person, but not talking about all the work um, that was going on at the same time. His collaborators, his peers. Um, so that's what I was really seeing here. And I'm thankful for his writings because he wasn't that egocentric as his uh, biographers. I found the resistance of the air by the following experiments. Okay. So now it's actually his experiment. So that was my frustration with the first half of the book was that it was geometry. It, it was uh, proving things by, um, by geometry, not experiment. So I'm like, nothing to do with the planets and data from the planets or observations astronomically and none of that data. It was all geometry. And I was just like, this isn't what I expected at all, right? But now he starts getting to experiments. You see more numbers in this section. I found by an hydrostatical uh, experiment that the weight of this wooden globe was to the weight of a globe of water of the same magnitude as 55 to 97. So he's actually doing some some experiments, man. I also counted the oscillations in which the pendulum lost one fourth of its motion. So he's actually doing experiments. I was like, cool, this is cool. I don't really care what you deduce from it because we got better machines and better everything now <laughs> to take measurements, but good for you. Uh, this experiment is related by memory, the paper being lost in which I had described it so that I have been obliged to omit some fractional parts which are slipped out of my memory. And I have no leisure to try it again. The first time I made it, the hook being weak, the full box was retarded sooner. I was like, right. So you can write and take your time with everything else, but now you're like, I don't need to tell you this other thing because, uh, you know, this is all from memory. So I'm like, did you steal from somebody else? Um, okay. Let's see. But, you know, you just got to question everything you read, man. You can't just take everything at face value because if you did, good God, you're just taking other people's opinions. Opinions. A lot of times. Um, to define the motion of water running out of a cylindrical vessel through a hole made at the bottom. I was like, all right, you were on fluids. But again, he's talking about the motion of bodies as well as fluids. So I get why it's in here. You know, I get that. I get that. Yet in both cases, it acquires in the descent, in its descent, the same velocity as Galileo has demonstrated. Okay. We're actually almost done. I'm, I'm shocked here. Um, but the ending really just brought it all together for me. In order to investigate the resistances of fluents from experiments, I procured a small wooden vessel whose length and breadth on the inside was nine inches English measure and its depth nine feet and a half. Um, uh, this I filled with rainwater. Oh, so the thing I didn't mention that I may have, no, I, I think it's coming up. Uh, he talks about English measure and Paris measure. So these different uh, forms of measurement. Um, experiment 14. So he, I mean, I was just surprised at how many experiments he broke down right here. So that was, this is what I expect the science to look like in regards to motions of bodies, not theoretical. I don't like book one. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. To find the velocity of waves, I was like, good, good, good. Waves, light. Oh, he doesn't hit. He talks a little bit about magnetism, um, but not a lot about um, stuff on the atomic level. Nah. So electricity. He relates magnetism to uh, gravity a little bit, but uh, he doesn't really go in depth on that at all. Uh, okay, 11.42 feet of English measure or 10.70 feet of French measure. Therefore, there are near 100 pulses in the space of 1070 Paris feet. And I was like, all right, whatever you want to call that. 
Um, oh, oh, it's it's coming up. I'm sure it's coming up. I told you it was gonna get good. This is when it got good for me. I had a moment of like, what? Like out loud. Okay, hence it is manifest that the planets are not carried around in corporal vertices. For according to the Copernican hypothesis, the planets going around the sun revolve in ellipses. So this came from Copernican. I mean, from <laughs> from Copernicus, right? Um, having the sun in their common focus. This is how we learn about it. And by radii drawn to the sun, describe areas proportional to the times. Okay, so again, he's not saying he invented that. He gives credit where credit is due. Uh, the velocity of the earth at the beginning of Pisces would be to its velocity. So I was excited here because he's now talking about astronomical data, finally. And he has some knowledge of the um, of the uh, zodiac signs of the, um, you know, constellations. That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> and he's talking about minutes and stuff. And I was like, all right, all right, cool, cool. So that the hypothesis of vertices is utterly irreconcilable with astronomical phenomena. And rather serves to perplex than explain the heavenly motion. So I couldn't, uh, you know, contest with any of that because astronomy is still something I'm learning more about. All right, so book three. Here we go. In the preceding books, I have laid down the principles of philosophy, principles not philosophical but mathematical, such to it as we may build our reasonings upon in philosophical inquiries. I'm like, uh, you did a little bit of math, a little bit, but it was more philosophical to me than it was mathematical because you were just inserting uh, anyway I, I've said it over and over again anyway that's my opinion it remains that from the same principles I now demonstrate uh, the frame of the system of the world upon the subject I had indeed composed the third book in a popular method yes he did um, therefore to prevent the disputes which might be raised upon such accounts I chose to reduce the substance of this book into the form of propositions in the mathematical way which should be read by those only who had first made themselves masters of the principles established in the preceding books. What? You tell me I need to master everything you said. Or accept it and then read this book. It is enough if one carefully reads the definitions, the laws of motion in the first three sections of this book. Uh, he may then pass on to this book and consult such of the remaining propositions of the first two books as the references in this and his occasion shall require. So basically, if you just go ahead and accept everything so far, you can go ahead and accept my conclusions here. I was like, nah, bro, that ain't that ain't how you do it. But um, I think that a lot of people did that because, again, he didn't prove the stuff in book one. He just combined things. Let's just insert centripetal acceleration. Let's insert these rules of motion. Let's insert uh, these velocities and gravity. We'll insert that onto the geometry. We'll just place it in every kind of geometric proof. We're gonna entwine it from, from angles to ad infinitum to, to decreasing areas to, uh, I mean, we're just gonna insert this thing on geometry. That's what I saw. Uh, nature is pleased with simplicity and affects not the pomp of superfluous causes. I disagree. Nature is not that simple. We are pleased with simplicity and we love to simplify things regardless of how complex it may be. Simplicity can be the goal, but to ignore the complexity is the error. That's in my mind. Okay. We are certainly not to relinquish the evidence of experiments for the sake of dreams and vain functions of our own devising. Nor are we to recede from the analogy of nature, which uses to be simple and always consonant to itself. Okay. And thence we conclude the least particles of all bodies to be also extended and hard and impenetrable and movable and endowed with their proper vers inertia. And this is the foundation of all philosophy. Really? That's the foundation of all philosophy. I respectfully disagree. Um yet okay let's see emphasis on division rather than union, a, a, a unity so, so by the way this is my favorite book this is my favorite book and it only is my favorite after having traversed the first two um yet had we the proof of but one experiment that any undivided particle in breaking a hard and solid body suffered a division we might by virtue of this rule conclude that the undivided as well as the divided particles may be divided and actually separated to infinity he actually translated ad infinitum right there. Okay. Um, so here, it was a focus on division. And here, 
because he was talking a little bit about nature. And again, I'm thinking nature and nature in myself, nature without, nature within, nature without. And you see here this kind of uh, just this, I didn't like that separating to infinity, but I like that he acknowledged it because we always think that, or we learn that this is the smallest, this is the smallest until we find something smaller smaller in the quantum realm and then something else smaller and all the way down to string theory. Um, so even back then, he acknowledged that things can continue to be separated. So that was cool. By experiments and astronomical observations that all bodies about the Earth gravitate towards the Earth. Okay. Wait a minute. What, what? Yeah. <laughs> My comment was not proven in this book at all. Um, but he said by experiments. But I think when he even said experiments, he was talking about geometric proofs and uh, inductions with reasonings, but not, he didn't, okay, anyway. By experiments and astronomical observations that all bodies about the earth gravitate toward the earth and that in proportion to the quantity of matter which they severally contain, that the moon likewise, according to the quantity of its matter, gravitates toward the earth, that on the other hand, our sea gravitates toward the moon and all the planets mutually one towards another and the comets in like manner towards the sun. We must, in consequence of this rule, universally allow that all bodies whatsoever are endowed with the principle of mutual gravitation. So one thing I love that he explains the tides. He goes deep into the tides. And of course, I thought about uh, what's that mother? <laughs> Bill O'Reilly and how he was talking about that, that famous clip when he was saying that we don't understand the tides. And it was like, uh, do we do. And he went to what, Harvard or something? And I thought about it doesn't matter your level of education. If you're being taught to regurgitate things from people who hadn't been forced to do certain just what seems like reasonable research in their fields because of the way our education system is set up, then you come out being a really smart, dumb person, knowing just what was told, but at no point in your life having to dive to understand anything beyond the surface level. So uh, you have these big bumps in your understanding, like, oh, we do know about tides. Oh, that's a part of the same theories that I was learning with gravity. Oh, that's crazy. You know, it's in the same document. You know, I didn't I didn't know that either. Right. Um, so here are the periodic times of the satellites of Jupiter. So, boom, he's given all these observations from all these people. And I was like, what? We got this. Uh, so I think Micron is short for micrometer. We got his telescope. Um, yeah, by the help of excellent micrometers. I don't even know what those really are, but all these people who have done all these observations, I was like, wow, didn't know that. They were doing that much in the 17th century while uh, other people were being forced to work um, and be killed, and these people are up studying science. Okay, the distances of the satellites from Saturn's center and semi-diameters of its ring, but the greatest elongation of the satellite <clears throat> from Saturn's center when taken with an excellent micrometer and Mr. Huggins telescope, the same dude, man. If there's anybody worth studying behind, I mean, this dude just keep coming up. He keep coming up. Um, let's see. Okay, so you're talking about Mercury and Venus. Uh, same as demonstrable for Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, the mean distances. Uh, okay. Kepler and above all, I have determined from these observations with greatest accuracy and the mean distances corresponding to the periodic times. So I was thinking Kepler and the other, and the other guy are maybe the guys who uh, I could lean to to see. Um, <clears throat> uh oh. Yeah. To uh, learn more about the orbits okay almost done here that the force by which the moon is retained in its orbit tends to the earth and is reciprocally as a square of the distance and so here we go with that inverse square law uh, the action of the sun attracting the moon from the earth is nearly as the moon distance from the earth so that was something i had almost forgot to think about was the attraction of the sun in this gravity theory then okay we got the earth attracting the moon but then we got the sun attracting the moon and of course they explain it away with well it's so close to earth that the effects of the sun's gravity is negligible or it doesn't affect this and that but all of these little acceptances this little and the same thing between two 
the people on earth the two items on earth you can't demonstrate the attraction between two bodies because you're so small that the gravity of earth just overshadows the gravity between these two but then of course electromagnetic force between you know that's the much stronger force and you have these levels of force and it's you're inserting all these theories on natural phenomena like oh yeah we, we can't measure this but we're gonna say that that's real um this model of weird uh this thing is real to explain our phenomenon. Okay. That the moon gravitates toward the earth and by the force of gravity is continually drawn off from a rectilinear motion and retained in its orbit. <clears throat> explain the moon's orbit. Didn't do it sufficiently to me. This calculus is founded on the hypothesis of the earth's standing seal. Uh, so this was cool it, because he was saying, now I ain't gonna lie. I've listened to some of, uh, what's his name? Eric DeBay and uh, Flat Earth. <clears throat> I didn't accept much of it, but I realized that I can't prove a lot of stuff. And here I was thinking about when I was taking my um, rocket science class in uh, grad school, uh, he mentioned something about the way that we uh, shoot things off into space and all of that. And it's always in regards to, in no regard to the earth spinning, like to put, um, uh, the speed of earth into the calculations of how this rocket is going to go off or how we're going to, um, the, the trajectory going up, like, Oh, you get off of the earth. And now it's as if you're always moving simultaneous with the speed of the earth. Like you, you just don't even think about it. You don't even think about the earth spinning. You just, you just don't. Um, <clears throat> so for him to say that is found on the hypothesis of the earth standing still, uh, for if both Earth and Moon move about the sun and at the same about their common center of gravity, the distance of the centers of the Moon and the Earth, blah, blah, blah. So he mentions that. He is really uh, thorough. The force which retains the celestial bodies in their orbits has been hitherto called centripetal force, but it's been now made plain that it can be no other than a gravitating force. We should hereafter call it gravity. For the cause of the centripetal force which retains the Moon in its orbit will extend itself to all planets by rule 1, 2, and 4. What time is it? Oh, shit. Yeah, he's gonna come in pretty soon. Um, <clears throat> appreciate him not coming out of school. Uh, let's see. If it is objective according to this law, all bodies with, with us must mutually gravitate one towards another, whereas no such gravitation anywhere it appears. I answer that since the gravitation towards these bodies is to the gravitation towards the whole Earth, as these bodies are to the whole Earth, the gravitation towards them must be far less than to follow the observation of our senses. So that goes to what I was saying. If you have two bodies and they're too small, you can't see the gravitation towards the bodies because, you know, they're, it's, it's not, we can't sense it. The earth, if it is not for its greater density, would emerge from the seas and according to this degree of levity would be raised more or less above the surface, the water of the seas flowing backward to the opposite side. So, uh, this main thing about density in general, that duh, right? Um, soil is going to be less dense than water. Hence, water seeps into the soil, goes down, but we have water tables because underneath that water is much denser rock. I just had never put together the layers of density in regards to land and water um, in that way until I read that. And I was like, oh yeah, duh. <laughs> uh, let's see. Again, almost finished now. The Observatory of Paris, the Observatory of Citadel of Dunkirk. So um, didn't know there were observatories back then. So again, this is the astronomy aspect, which I'm getting closer to. I'm getting there. And the force of gravity, force of gravity at the pole is to the force of gravity at the equator. Uh, so here he is like using um, astronomical data and inserting gravity onto astronomical data. He's not proving it. He's just saying this is what gravity should be then. Right. So I, I didn't even care to see if those values have changed or if it didn't make sense. And it's, you know, were they errors here or were they corrected? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, let's see. Now, several astronomers sent into remote countries to make astronomical observations have found that pendulum clocks do accordingly move slower near the equator than in our climate. So here I thought about these several astronomers sent to remote countries. How were they getting to these countries? This is after enslavement and the Middle Passage was starting to take place and Europe 
was going around the world and you hear about these stories. I read about this one book about a guy who's working on the clock and he's on a ship going going to the Caribbean. That's how it was introduced. Nothing else about the context. And it's like when they were taking enslaved people or just visiting those islands, you had people sent to do astronomical work, going across the Atlantic, working on astronomy, going, setting up observatories, working on pendulums, working on clocks, making measurements for latitude, longitude. They were scientists being sent out on missions during the process of uh, mass exploitation and genocide. Um, so, I mean, that just is what stuck out. Like you got people who, um, don't mind the death. Uh, I'm not here to work. In the following years, 1699 and 1700, Monsieur de Hans uh, making another voyage to America, determining that in the island of Cayenne and Granada, the length of the pi- of the pendulum, Granada, uh, vibrating in seconds was a smaller matter. Okay, yeah, so that was another example of that. Uh, let's see, that's almost it. I got a couple more good things. Thus, I have explained the causes of the motion of the moon and of the sea. Yeah, you, you've explained it. Yeah, you gave one. Okay. To render the calculus more easy, we shall suppose the orbit of the moon to be circular and neglect all inequalities, but that only, which is now under consideration. So he's saying there's a circular orbit, and we're still going to explain a circular circular orbit with gravity. That doesn't make sense to me. That didn't make sense. No. Nope. Can't make me. Mm-mm. I'll argue it. Mm-mm. Okay, so... Uh, and we get to almost done. He gets into comets. Uh, let's see. Talking about oh yeah, one thing to note here. Have you heard about any calculus? Nope, because he doesn't talk about calculus for in this book. Not at all. Um, Mr. Mackin, astronomer, Professor Gresh, Dr. Henry Pemberton separately found out the motions of the modes by a different method. Mention has been made of this method in another place. There are several papers, both of which I have seen, contain two propositions and exactly agree with each other in both of them. Mr. Matchin's paper concerning first, Mr. Matchin's paper coming first to my hands, I shall here insert it. So again, he's putting other people's work in here. And this is all about the moon. The moon, the moon, the moon, the moon, the moon. I didn't, uh, yeah, I wasn't too big on that. Farther, I found that the apogee and those of the moon move faster in the perihelion of the earth where the force of the sun's action is greater than the aphelion thereof. So you have the prefix, the ap, apogee, aphelion, that's the furthest point. And you got the peri, perihelion, and that's like the real close point of like elliptical orbits or orbits in general. Closest points thereof. The, so apogee has to do with the moon and the earth and aphelion has to do with the earth on the sun so a lot of uh, astronomical terms throughout the text um, to look up and become familiar with um, but yeah let's see here uh, and since the true diameter of the moon from the observations of astronomers is to the true diameter of the earth as 165 the mass of of matter in the moon will be to the mass of the matter in the earth. Okay, so he's making these, uh, he's saying this is what they prove and I'm just gonna add a little sprinkle or I'm just gonna totally reproduce what they've done. Its own axis inclined to the plane of the ecliptic by an angle of 23 and a half degrees. So here you have that they have already taken into account the, um, uh, the tilt of the earth, right? Okay. All this in 17th century, crazy. Let's see, almost done. Gets real good at this ending. Uh, yeah. Okay, he starts using Greek letters and he's giving a whole lot of data about these comments. This is like all comment stuff. Um, And I think he probably explains in some degree about Halley's Comet, but not a whole lot. Okay. The observations of Pontius and Celius are more rude, especially those which were made by taking the azimuth and altitude, as are also the obligations of Galitius. Um, 
So I was just mentioning that there's a lot of international collaboration while others were laboring, which I've already mentioned. The few, the elite, allowed to sit and experiment and not struggle to survive. Um, I'm not caught in fear. Oh, that was one thing I wanted to mention that um, I I could see through reading this about how and through some other things I've been listening to, but the culture, uh, the culture was set in such a way that the way that these scientists were able to daily talk about what they were studying, their experiments is very similar to the way that uh, people who were enslaved or people who were exploited or people in prison or people in any other station life talk about the things that they're going through and it, it, it's under the influence of something over them. So, for instance, someone who's in jail is going to speak about certain talks with the understanding that they can't get out of their situation. Um, and it creates a culture within that jail, within that prison, where everything is under the um, veil of not being out of that situation. So I was just thinking about how slavery and um, lower classes sort of come to be and how a lot of that has to do with the conditions you're forced under for a long period of time. And you don't know you're acting out a culture, but it's becoming a part of you because you're always under something by fear, by law, by force, violence, whatever it is. This most beautiful system of the sign, planets, and comets could only proceed from the council and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. So here we are at the end, and he's talking about God. And if the fixed stars are the centers of other like systems, these being formed by the wise council must be all subject to the dominion of one. Okay, he goes on. He's Oh, I thought I highlighted more. Yeah, yeah. Whence also he is all similar, all eye, all ear, all brain, all arm, all power to perceive, to understand, and to act, but in the manner not at all human, in a manner not at all corporal, in a manner utterly unknown to us. So he's speaking about this God figure, but at the same time he's personifying him with the pronoun he over and over again. Um, and, you know, hey, why don't we talk that way, right? Um but hitherto I have not been able to discover the cause of these properties of gravity from phenomena and I frame no hypotheses for whether whatever is not deduced from the phenomena is to be called an hypothesis and hypotheses whether metaphysical or physical whether of occult qualities or mechanical have no place in experimental philosophy in this philosophy particular propositions are inferred from the phenomena and afterwards rendered general by induction now that's exactly what he did Thus, it was that the impenetrability, the mobility, and the impulsive forces of bodies and the laws of motion and of gravitation were discovered. Um, And the members of the animal bodies uh, move at the command of the will, namely by the vibrations of the spirit. So he's kind of separating the idea of God here from from this spirit that uh, gives us movement in our bodies, the vibrations of the spirit. Uh, so our bodies can move at the command of the will. Um, so I found that interesting that, you know, in African cosmology, there is this connection with God and yourself and nature in general. All these things are connected. There is a one in all of us. And here you hear him speaking of us as animals. You know, members of animal bodies move at the command of the will, vibration of the spirit. <clears throat> so. And it goes on from the outward organs of sense to the brain and from the brain to the muscles. But these things that cannot be explained in few words, nor are we furnished with the sufficiency of experiments, which is required to an accurate determination and demonstration of the laws by which this electric and elastic spirit operates. And that's the end of his mathematical principles. Now, I love how, you know, just in my own life, I've been coming to this kind of spiritual awakening again. And even when I'm looking up old time mathematicians, scientists, he ends it with acknowledgement of a higher power. So for a person to ignore the higher power in their life uh, is interesting because you would want to think that, oh, you know, you've heard things like, you know, the lower rung of society or lower social strata, and they're going to be the religious and the 
the scientists, they're going to be the ones that, that know better and that sort of thing. But you're looking at, um, and you can go, you know, scientists, 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 to know that there is something that is not, cannot be personified, that is greater than you, a, a force, a spirit, a power, um, something as old as time. Man. So I'm just grateful for my own kind of spiritual awakening back in <laughs> awakening because it's been sleep. And it's been hard. Um, so anyway, all right. So here's this last section, System of the World. I think I got like two quotes in here. Um, oh, and what's the first one? The Egyptians were early observers, observers of the heavens. And from them, probably this philosophy was spread abroad among other nations. Far from them it was and the nations about them that the Greeks, a people of themselves more addicted to the study of philology than of nature, derived their first as well as soundest notions of philosophy and in the vestal ceremonies we may yet trace the ancient spirit of the egyptians for it was their way to deliver their mysteries that is their philosophy of things above the vulgar way of thinking under the veil of religious rites and hieroglyphic symbols the man gave respect to the egyptians what what now granted he spends more time on the uh, greeks and uh you know up through kepler but he's giving shout outs man from the beginning. Uh, I think that's it. Let's see. And I get to talk about my next book. Uh, yep. Let's see. More geometry. Uh, and he does have a great um, index in here too. Um, but yeah, I think this is all the comment stuff. And I was like, nah, man, I'm good. Um, the effects of the luminaries depend on latitude of places. Mm. Gravity, Plymouth, uh, the tide. Uh, yeah, I think I was done. I mean, I just finished this morning. Let's see. I think this is it. I'm going to. Uh, where went on 5 50 60 yeah this is about a year all right so let me just go ahead and show you my next book so that was it um great book uh toward the end book three but uh shoot nah not my favorite so my next book though is going to be excited about this one all right so there's the index yeah parabolas it's pretty good um yeah that's it all right the next book let me uh, bring you over here in this way. Do it like this, her. All right. It's going to be Intellectual Warfare. Jacob Carruthers. Let's go. I've been waiting to read this book. I'm so excited. I'm going to get through this bad boy quick. Um, so back to that. Um, hope you enjoyed the video and keep reading.